Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Aztec depictions in pop culture 500 years after the fall. I am excited to introduce our panelists for Comic-Con at Home 2020. With us today, with us today, we have David Bowles, an award-winning Mexican-American author and translator, as well as an associate professor of literature and Nahuatl at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. David has written more than 20 books, among them Feathered Serpent, Dark Heart of Sky, Myths of Mexico and Flower, oh, sorry, Dark Heart of Sky, Myths of Mexico, and Flower, Song, Dance, Aztec and Maya Poetry. In September, his graphic novel Rise of the Halfling King will be released, which Kirkus has called an unmissable adventure of mythical proportions. I am excited to read that. Next spring, the first volume in David's steampunk graphic novel series, Clockwork Curandera, will be published. His work has also been published in multiple anthologies, plus venues such as School Library Journal, Apex, Strange Horizons, Rattle, Translation Review, and the Journal of Children's Literature. In 2017, David was inducted into the Texas Institute of Letters. Very glad to have him. Also with us today is Flora Riz Arredondo. Flora is a freelance designer who specializes in background painting. She recently graduated with a BFA in animation and illustration at San Jose State University. She has worked as a production intern at the Cartoon Network on Victor and Valentino. She directed the short animated film Malinchista, which we'll see a little bit of today later in this discussion. And she's currently working as a publication production assistant and artist at Green Ninja. Flora loves integrating community outreach with artwork to create a positive impact on the society we live in. Javier Reon is the writer and game designer of Dream of Darkness, a Lovecraft and Aztecs video game. Javier comes from the ancient Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan, Tenochtitlan, otherwise known as the current Mexico City. He notices that authoritarians are on the rise again, and he believes that art and especially video games can prevent that by helping people realize that their choices matter. This was never more clear than in the Spanish Aztec encounter, this, the topic of our panel, which was the first contact between two worlds. This clash is full of mysteries to this day, and so instead of giving one account of the events, the Dream of Darkness game allows each player to make a unique story with their choices. Javier founded his game startup with developers and historians and earned a BA in game design. In the past, he has appeared on the TV show Shark Tank, presented at the NASA Ames Research Center, and created VR training to save lives. Javier loves history. I think we can say that about all our panelists today, and is also really into mezcal, coffee, and salsa dancing. Also with Mario, we have, uh, excuse me, also with Javier, we have Mario Fuente, who is a historian who graduated from the National School of Anthropology in Mexico. Mario studies the weaponry of the Spanish conquest and the post-classic war of Mesoamerica. He also loves video games and is the consulting historian on Javier's Dream of Darkness. I will say Mario has also uh, helpfully pointed out uh, several corrections to my husband Paul's series, Aztec Empire. And that brings us to Paul Guinan, who is a multimedia artist and a founding member. Oh, I skipped Mario's slide. Sorry, folks, technical error. And that brings us to Paul Guinan, uh, who, full disclosure, is my husband. Paul is a multimedia artist and a founding member of Helioscope Studio, the largest collective of comic book artists in North America. Paul has worked as a production artist, penciler, inker, and creator in the comic book field for more than 30 years. He created the series Cargonauts at First Comics, the time-traveling hero Kronos for DC Comics, and with me, the groundbreaking science fiction series Heartbreakers about a team of female clones, which debuted in Dark Horse Presents in 1989. Paul and I have also co-authored two illustrated historical fiction books, Boilerplate, History's Mechanical Marvel, and Frank Reed, Adventures in the Age of Invention. Paul's current project is a historical comic book series titled Aztec Empire with me and artist David Hahn. And my name is Anina Bennett. I'm a writer and a recovering comic book editor who's done time at First Comics, Dark Horse Comics, and other publishers. I've collaborated with my husband, Paul, on projects since the 1980s. 
I love history, comics, and cultural anthropology, among other things. And I am so excited to be excited to be talking with these panelists about these topics today. Uh, okay, so David, um, this is an image from uh, your current graphic novel, correct? Right. So, um, I mean, uh, most of my work is is centered um, on um, or draws from Mesoamerican um, sacred stories, mythology, legends, history, and so forth. Um, I have you know multiple series and books out. Like my my Garza Twin series is essentially um, like a Percy Jackson series with um, Mexican American kids facing off against Aztec and Mayan gods. Um, and I've done a lot of like more nonfiction things, retellings of of different legends, uh, retranslations and stuff like that. My book, Feathered Serpent, Dark Heart of Sky, Myths of Mexico, um, it was an award-winning book that um, retells kind of like the mythological history of Mexico from creation to conquest. And after that book came out and it was well-received and it's won several awards, the publisher approached me and asked whether I would be interested in doing a series of graphic novel adaptations of some of the stories in that book. And so we decided to go to, to start with this um, very famous um, Maya legend from, from the Yucatan Peninsula of the dwarf king of Uxmal, Uxmal being a, uh, a city state uh, towards the end of the, of the Mayan civilizations. And um, so you'll see that the, there is some artwork from the cover there. And here are, there's some interior art well, there we go, um, showing this half human, half alush, alush being a type of um, like, like dwarf-like or elf-like creature from, from Mayan legend. Um, you see uh, a new king being crowned in the city of Ushmal. The, this uh, halfling child lives in the city of Kaba. Um, can we advance to the next slide? And uh, you see as he ages, he, he learns of this uh, prophecy that he will be replaced one day by, um, by, by a new king. And this, um, this boy has been raised by a witch, by a shemen. Um, she found an egg one day on the, on the road and she picked it up and she took it home and it cracked open and out walked a child who could, who could speak and, and, um, and reason. Uh, it was a gift from the Alushas. And uh, they have been planning for a long time to get rid of the, this kind of tyrant that's ruling over the area. And um, you can see the great artwork from uh, my daughter, Charlene Bowles. Now, my daughter is an illustrator um, who she, she got a, her BFA a few years ago, and she lives in Austin, works on different uh, projects. And she's the one who's done the covers of my Garza Twin books. And she's also the, uh, the first illustrator in the series. Each book is going to have a, a different illustrator. Um, super excited about the, the work that you could see here. She's got a very distinctive style. Now, these um, graphic novels are being written with a middle grade audience in mind. So they're, it, it's, uh, we're thinking about kids ages eight to like 15, but there's a lot to love in them for all age groups. And um, it, it plays into a lot of the themes that, that you find in the rest of my work. And next year I have a graphic novel a aimed at a, an older, uh, group that you talked about, Clockwork Curandera, that draws more from Aztec mythology um, in a steampunk setting. So it's just, I think it's, it's, it's refreshing and, and um, creatively invigorating to use this iconography and these stories, not only because of what it can do for you as a creator, but also for it, what it does in terms of getting the word out about these great stories that have been overlooked because as we've seen time and time again, everybody wants to go to sacrifice and all the weird um, oddities that they see um, rather than really enjoying the complexities and richness of Aztec and, and more broadly Mesoamerican um, storytelling. It's also wonderful to uh, draw on this type of mythology, especially because in this country, we are sort of overloaded with things that are drawn on Greek and Roman mythology, I feel like. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so many rich traditions around the world. And it's wonderful to see these things um, not only being remembered, but being worked into uh, works of fiction and visual, uh, visual works that where people can work and really come alive for people. 
So it sounds like, David, you're using a combination of you're drawing on uh, some elements of the culture in terms of mythology, but also historical elements in terms of the way society was actually organized and what kinds of roles this, this boy might be involved in. Yeah, all of those things. Um, you know, it's when I was writing for the Serpent Dark Heart of Sky, there's a, there's a couple of written sources, but they're all like, you know, from the 1700s and beyond. So one of the things that I did was to go to um, to d different places in in uh, in Yucatan and Quintana Roo, the two states that are that make up the the Yucatan Peninsula, and to to interview older people and ask them, you know, ¿sabe usted la historia del rey enano de Uxmal? And, and you know, do you know the story of the dwarf king Uxmal? And uh, invariably there'd be somebody who'd be like, oh yes, you know, I heard the story when I was a kid, and I would whip out my smartphone and can I record you? And um, just to try to also provide some texture because it's a, it's an oral story that's been passed down. Um, for for many years and and um, you know each one of the the stories that we use in, in the graphic novel is going to be from just like feathered serpent dark heart of sky brings in initially some early things from from like Toltec and uh, uh, and Maya traditions and then later moves more firmly into Nahua specifically Mexica uh, Aztec uh, tradition and so it's you know it's great to it, the fact that I'm also um, a professor of Nahuatl and a translator of Nahuatl helps me to, you know, access those primary source texts and try to draw from them and convey the richness of the language as well. And I've studied um, Yucateco, the, the dialect of Maya that would have been spoken by um, the, the dwarf king here, the, the halfling king, as we call him in this book. So, you know, those kinds of things add texture. Wonderful. And I think it's so cool that you're doing it with your uh, daughter. Oh yeah, no, it's it's great when those kinds of opportunities come up. It's great, um, so I love it. Um, and David, just real quick, how did you? Uh, what was sort of your first exposure to some of the what you would now consider more newer interpretations of the culture and the history? I mean, um, you know, a lot of that would just came through pop culture through comics. You know, I, I there were. Um, and both Marvel and DC have played around, for example, um, they did in, in the, especially in the 60s and 70s with um, gods like, you know, especially like nearly everybody had some kind of variation on Quetzalcoatl. There was even a, a DC um, hero named Aztec with a K. Um, there, you know, you, you see that kind of sprinkled through and, and you see it in, um, in movies as well, adventure movies from the 70s and 80s. But it wasn't really until I got into college and started realizing that as a Mexican American, I had missed out on a lot of the actual um, stories of uh, pre Columbian Mesoamerica that I started down the rabbit hole that that led me to to, to doing the that. kind of We're, work that I do. Yeah. People who love research always say rabbit hole. I say that yeah. too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is definitely a rabbit hole. Um, okay, I want to make sure we have time to get to everyone. So, uh, Flora. Um, you have created this uh, short animated film called Malinchista, um, and we have a few slides showing different, the very different art styles that you used in different parts of the, the film, which I think is beautiful, um, but it also has larger significance because of the, uh, the character that, you're, that, that you're, is being explored in this. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about her and about the inspiration for this film? Yeah, absolutely. I'm Flora again. And Malinchista is a 2D animated short film that is reclaiming a Spanish slur in order to empower Latinx women by retelling the life of La Malinche. And for those of you who don't know about La Malinche, she was the one who guided and translated for Cortez between all the different indigenous groups. So even 500 years later, she is so hated as this treasonous woman who betrayed her people and led the downfall of the Aztec Empire that her name, La Malinche, is actually a slur in the Spanish language, Malinchista. And when I, when I learned about her in college, I was so amazed about the history of this woman. There's no written, no pictures of anything that she thought or felt about her situation because her whole life she was a victim, she was a slave, she had no choices, and she made choices with the little that she had her entire life. And I wanted to bring to life her story because there's so many women in history, even today, that are unheard and don't have their voices shown. And by showing La Maninja's story, I want to start taking that back and to tell women today that you have worth and you have meaning and you have a voice and you can use your voice just like La Maninja did, 
even though she was then demonized for hundreds of years, which is, again, very unfortunate, and the reason why I want to make this film. And I made the story through the eyes of Madi, who is a 15-year-old high school girl in Mexico, and she goes on a school trip to the Museo de Antropología, where she is bullied and learns the story of La Malinche. And Mari is based on myself before college when I, I spent most of my life unsure of my identity as a mixed Mexican individual because I wasn't white enough, I wasn't Mexican enough, and I wasn't too in touch with my culture until I started going out of my way to learn and educate myself. And I wanted to showcase a character and a cast of characters that were diverse and representative so that other kids today and people my age can look at animation and look at media and think, oh, that's me, that looks like me. And it's not have such a narrow range of characters and stories within animation, which thankfully is starting to diversify in this decade, which is amazing. So here you see Mari and the curator who is the one who tells her about La Malinche. And what was exciting is that we have 2D rigged animation for the sequence, and then it flows into a completely abstract, traditionally animated poem sequence with textures and completely fluid animation. There's two cuts within the whole a minute 30 that the sequence takes place. And this is basically months and half a year of research of me and my team researching La Malinche and trying to guess why she made the choices, the choices that she made and how she felt and what her life was like because she was actually royalty and then she was sold by her mother into slavery and then she was a slave by, um, by some chiefs, the natives, and then she was a slave to the Spaniards and then Cortez and then after Cortez was done with her, after he got the, the nation, after he conquered the Aztecs, then he married her away to some random Spaniard and her own son was sent to Spain and she never saw him again. So I wanted to showcase her story and what she felt or possibly felt through this. And that's Malinchista. She is such a fascinating character and I really like the way you approached this um, animation where it's a young girl uh, who, who's, who's learning more deeply about the, about the history behind her. And she's also one of these characters who exists in the only in the sort of margins and the empty spaces of the the traditional Spanish driven narrative, right? So, so were you in a way forming your own uh, ideas of who she was and 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 what might have motivated her, like you were talking about, as you were working on this? Oh, definitely. Last summer was me and at first six people, and then it grew to fifty over the past year. We were just brainstorming and researching all these articles because we found like we were saying earlier in this discussion, the only real fragments are the codices, which were written by the Spaniards. And again, the victors write history, so who knows how accurate they are. But they talk about how smart and beautiful and talented this woman was, but there's nothing written by her, even though she's in almost every codice for the Florentine codices. So it's, it's really fascinating, and it's this weird place where she's so famous but also not heard at all which is very interesting yeah well i think everyone people read their own uh their own things into her especially because we don't have a lot of information but when you're when we're re-examining history both as historians and as people who are creating fiction i feel like you have to look in those those hidden corners and those those places where where the quote-unquote heroes of the story, the previous heroes of the story, um, marginalized people because they didn't really think they were important. And that's where you find some really interesting uh, characters who do turn out to be very important. Um, we do have a brief animation. Uh, would you like to show the animation? Definitely. Would you like so, okay, let's get that. So this is our first trailer showing Malinchista. And we're going through the festival circuit right now. So it won't be released for another year at least, but you could find this one online. And at the end of this panel, we will show everybody's websites and Twitter handles so that you can go check out uh, their work in more detail if you're interested. Chantal, Nauto, Yucatec, and Spanish, then fell into the hands of a man on a conquest, Hernán Cortés. He... Well, that's a very brief clip, but I think it gives a nice flavor of the, uh, the animation from that sequence. It's really lovely. Thank you. We also spent a lot of time trying to show different body shapes and again, different shades of Latinx skin. And if you notice, Madi has arm hair, which took, it took us months to, to design 
because I've never seen an animated character, a woman with arm hair. So we wanted to get it just right and to make sure we included that as well. Oh, that's great. Um, I do want to move on to uh, uh, Javier and Mario in Dream of Darkness. Hola, let me take you on a trip to the Aztec underworld. I'm Javier, game designer and writer of Dream of Darkness. We're a Lovecraft and Aztecs adventure for PC. What makes our indie game special is that we're offering a unique story per player. And we are portraying the real mysteries of the encounter between the Spanish and the Aztec Empire. You are Anton de Alaminos, a Spanish pilot who in 1518 sails to the New World. Our characters, like the Spanish, Aztecs and more, have complex objectives. For example, Anton finds a secret letter pointing to a rich Maya settlement. If you give it to our Motolinia priest, when his main objective is baptizing the locals, he will use the letter to go and evangelize. But when his main concern is protecting the Indians' lives, he will destroy the document so none can reach them. This is based on these real characters' conflicting interests. We also research the gods with our historians and create original mechanics to reflect their strange powers. For example, you find the Aztec god of the underworld, Mictlantecutli. He will kill you unless you demonstrate that you have lived a life of worth. So how do you play it? Instead of the scripted lines of movies and games where everyone must get satisfied with the same story, we invited players to our studio to write whatever they wanted to the god. The entity would reply with intelligent, meaningful answers. What the fuck? <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> Excellent! Are you freaking out? I am kind of freaking out, yes. <laughs> So the program is actually learning from the user, something yeah. like that? Okay. Play our Lovecraft and Aztecs adventure. You can use a code. Aztec Comic Con to get 10% off at dreamofdarkness.com slash play. And it's all set in 1518 when the protagonist Anton de Laminos uh, is part of a company and they come to the new world. This is before Cortez. But uh, since I'm surrounded by such an interesting panel, I, I thought that we could explore more facets. For example, uh, based in Mexico City, this is a, a more personal story for me because uh, it all comes back to my dad. Um, whenever we had, as you know, history lessons, fortunately we do cover history about the Aztecs some, somehow here in the curriculum. Uh, he would uh, always be very happy to review the history exam with me, prepare me for it. And my mom would be angry, almost like this god right here. <laughs> And my mom would be super angry whenever my dad helped me because uh, while the official curriculum in Mexico would only ask, hey, who was the Aztec emperor and who defeated him? And that's it. No more questions. My dad always stressed me to say, well, but they were more than the Aztecs. It was the Triple Alliance, but it was not only Cortes. He had plenty of allies. Where are the uh, Huejotzincas? Where are the Totonacas? So uh, my dad, since I was uh, very little, he always told me to look for the truth, to find the truth, to ask what's the evidence. And that's the core theme of our game, find the truth no matter the sacrifice. So when we started the game, uh, Mario was so helpful, our historian, because I had so many things wrong. As someone who is just passionate about history, but not a professional. And uh, he, fortunately has shown me so much interesting things so that we are trying to convey by adding this 
uh, Lovecraftian vibe, that is the Lovecraftian themes, which would be uh, civilizations that are so different from the usual, from the West, and that fits perfectly the aspects. For example, here we have some scenes regarding these cosmic entities. We have the Titsumitl, which would be stars who came down to heaven. Have you ever, anyone in the audience, uh, had tequila or mezcal? Well, <laughs> this is the origin of this. So the, uh, there was one goddess, Mayawel, who was a star in the sky, but Quetzalcoatl, he asked her to come down uh, to the earth because he was in love with her. The grandmother of Mayawel was so angry that she sent down the Titi Mittel, these stars who would hunt down uh, Mayawel. And they would, uh, they eventually found, according to leg the legend, Mayawel killed her. Quetzalcoatl was so struck from this. He only found her remains, so he buried her. And out of Mayawel's remains, uh, out came the agave. And this is a plant where all tequila and mezcal comes from. The, the medium of the video game, uh, it can also be defined as the art of thinking and doing. In contrast with a movie, where you can be tired by the end of the day and you just sit down and the movie plays by itself. In games, if you don't do anything, nothing happens. So here we have our, uh, we will have three protagonists. Uh, one is Spanish, as I mentioned, Anton de Laminos, who was a real sailor. Uh, we will have a Tlaxcalteca princess and we will have an Aztec warrior. And we will see how it was a real clash of cultures. As Anina well said, like a Game of Thrones how we have these complex uh, groups, how we have complex characters, and we'll, you will have these impossible situations because you can't be friends with everyone, naturally. You will have to make hard choices, and by making these choices, you will appreciate better what happened, how everyone was just looking for their own. And something that I enjoy a lot is that there's an audience, sometimes not here in Mexico, but elsewhere, that appreciates going into more detail. When I originally approached Mario, our historian, I had the idea of just including this usual legend of the five sons that they would, uh, that they died, and that would be the main Aztec theme. He corrected me. He said, no, that's something that the priests invented. More uh, much of what we know of the Aztecs actually comes from sources like the like uh, the Codice of Florentino we have already mentioned that were uh, written by priests or that had informants but who were already catholically educated they were already Christians or they were enemies of the Aztecs. Uh, this game is currently in development and that's, so what we're looking correct. at is, is pre-production sketches and, and artwork. Yeah. So these are not actually images from the game. Um, but anyone who's interested in this game, which uh, Javier, I want you to just spend one, but a little less than a minute uh, telling us about the unique user experience, which I think is very interesting. But anyone who's interested in the development of this game can actually follow Javier and Dream of Darkness and kind of watch as the game is being developed and even potentially contribute to it as uh, beta testers. Thanks a lot, Alina. That is true. We listens to our players. We share things more uh, earlier than other studios. Usually you would not see the concept art of a game until it has already been published and it's successful and you can, back, you can look back uh, happily of the success. But in our case, just as I am making changes based on what Mario says, we're also adjusting based on what our users say we have for example one of our top um, supporters Ben from Norway so in one of our playtests we used a uh, codex and we asked our players to solve it we are we don't have combat because as many have said uh, this depiction of violence is sometimes exaggerated and what was surprising is that since I included this codex for our players to solve naturally gamers assumed that it was solvable what I didn't tell them it, is that it was a real codex. So far, we don't know exactly what it means. And users like Ben, well, they found by themselves pictograms of Nahuatl from the 16th century. We have in Mexico people who speak Nahuatl, but they don't use that, uh, those symbols anymore. 
myself as a Mexican, I have never seen those symbols until Ben and his awesome community looked for them. So I am very excited about the opportunity of showing uh, my history, my civilization, trying to get across uh, the real version, if that's possible, and for them to play with it. And maybe they can find uh, values and legends that are interesting for everyone. We have Paul and Aztec Empire. Um, this is a little different from the other projects in that it's uh, attempting to be a more straightforward historical uh, telling of events, um, as opposed to incorporating elements of the culture and history into a, a more fictional work. Um, and, uh, but it's also heavily research based and kind of like Javier's game, it's being produced almost in real time. Um, it's being posted on our website and on Patreon. And so you can follow along as Paul is creating new pages. Um, so Paul, just real quick, can you tell us what we're looking at here on this page? And then we're going to look at a page that shows some of the source material that you use for research. Right. Um, well, uh, just to some quick background, I've, uh, my dad instilled in me a love of history since a little kid. And um, all of my works have more or less had some kind of historical element to them. And as the 500th anniversary of these events approached, I grew increasingly frustrated by the fact that there was no authentic visual version of the story. There's plenty of prose, plenty of histories. Um, so uh, so I, I, I decided to undertake this thing. <laughs> may have bitten off more than I can chew because not only do you have to research the text, you have to research the visuals. And then you have to double all of that work for the Spanish side of the story. So, um, so after doing a little bit of research and realizing how much myth was involved in this story, I realized I had to go all the way back. And so I started looking at the original source materials, uh, the memoirs of Bernal Diaz, the Florentine Codex, um, and then all the supplemental stuff that surrounds that. And so this is a, a page from, uh, from uh, the first episode. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that- Well, tell us, where, where, what are we looking at here, Paul? What is oh, this amazing well, this city? A, uh, uh, we're looking at uh, Tenochtitlan, uh, but just a part of it. Uh, the south part of the sacred precinct, which everybody's familiar with, which has the giant temples. And this sequence has, uh, it, we open, with a messenger coming from the coast, giving the latest information about these weird people that have shown up. And um, so we can go to the next one. So any given panel has to have, I have to do the research on um, the clothing, the patterns of the clothing, but most importantly, the symbology in the murals, because uh, you can't just throw down any fun looking uh, <laughs> image because everything has a meaning. So uh, I like to use the analogy about it's, it's like looking at a photograph of say one of these uh, teenager in Japan wearing an English shirt and the phrase is nonsensical. You know, like I, I didn't want to be put in that kind of a situation. So, uh, so I've, I've tried to research every detail of it, which is why it's taking forever. <laughs> so next page. And so this is, a, this is one of my favorite pages. This introduces the princess of Moctezuma uh, and uh, and her palace. Actually, there's some interesting backstory about her. Uh, and most, and this is another example of how of how bad information gets spread over centuries. Is that the original perception of this princess is that she was 12, but then I looked it up, and it turns out she was born during the reign of this one king previous to Moctezuma, which would have made her 17. So I was happy to find that out because uh, I needed a, I needed the telenovela. And, and, and in this, I, I didn't want to just tell a straight story, you know, just the facts. I wanted to immerse yourself in the characters and their lives and, uh, and try as best as I can to explain some of the motivations. She's uh, also another that. female indigenous character who was really non-existent pretty much in the Spanish uh, narratives. And, um, and you've, you know, like pulled her out and tried to make her into a real person. Right, and she has one of the most roller coaster. I mean, Malinche, of course, is, 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 has, has quite a story, but, uh, but this, this, this woman rivals that in that she was uh, originally married to one of Montezuma's Council of Four, uh, a main advisory body. He died during the Alvarado massacre, and then she was married off to the successor to Montezuma when he was killed by the Spaniards. But the successor only lasted you know, uh, not long because he died of smallpox. So then she had a third husband, which was then 
which was the, the emperor that then rose up against uh, the Spaniards and has become a bit of a national uh, a hero in, in Mexico. And I love so, how you go to town with all these murals. That's, that, that is definitely uh, time consuming, but it looks gorgeous. Um, Cause I think we, many of us saw, who've, who've seen archeological ruins um, often think of these things as having been white or stone colored because also that's how they showed Greek and Roman statues and temples in old movies. But in reality, many of them were very brightly painted. It's exciting to see them that way. Yeah, and, if, and, and, and here's, here's a breakdown of, of the reference for that panel. And um, because there's not a lot of Mexica murals left, I was borrowing stuff from uh, Teotihuacan and uh, the Mexica were obsessed with Teotihuacan anyway. So they, they incorporated a lot of design work from that in their own stuff. So you can see here, it's, it's not only am I researching uh, architecture and jewelry and costumes, but also I even want to get the plants right. So, so I'm a little obsessive, which actually benefits this project, my obsessions. So the, so here's an example of, of, uh, again, the best source of information that we have about some of these costumes. This one example is from the Codex Mendoza. It's one of my favorites because it's uh, so colorful. Again, it's a colonial codex. Um, but you know, it's, you know, we got, you got to work with what you have. And so this is as close as we can get. So here's the council of four and, and, and this group hasn't, uh, they haven't shown up in any history since the 16th century. I mean, the, they're, they're mentioned in, in several codexes in the Florentine Codex, but no, no modern uh, history. Like for instance, one of the great histories, the potent great histories of, of this topic is by Hugh Thomas. It was written in 1990s and he's an English historian. Uh, and, and his work is like 900 pages, ultra detailed. And not only, and he doesn't even mention these guys. And these are so, political advisors to uh, Moctezuma? Yeah, yeah, they were two, two of them were generals and two of them were um, like what we would call constables. And uh, all of them had religious backgrounds. So you're weaving all of this into a story that's trying to be accurate, even though as Mario has told us, we really don't know anything. And <laughs> <laughs> so, so you mean, yeah. Sorry. in a way, Sorry. all the work that everyone on this panel is doing is, um, is adding to the to the to the academic interpretation of these things because academics are only allowed to go so far. Historians and archaeologists, I think, can only go so far in speculation, right? Right, yeah. right. Then then they get accused of making stuff up. But I have the advantage of being just a comic book artist. So you know, telling a comic book story. And lastly, um, I know that as an artist, this is one of your favorite pages. Um, and I think David Bowles also ha has in your graphic novel, you have a page of uh, the young man writing or making a, making a book. Right. So this is beautiful. And this is the way that they uh, would have documented um, what they saw of the Cortez uh, invasion or expedition. Right. right, and again, you know, I have to make sure that, I mean, like there's no way we could ever know what an artist studio looked like. So I have to make all these guesses. For instance, uh, I'm familiar with some of the paper making techniques, some of the materials that they used and like little details, like they would, they would uh, cut a Nautilus shell in half to use as a, as a, as a palette for colors. Um, we're, you know, we, we, we have some information about, so for instance, uh, the murals in the background, uh, these are patron gods of things that relate to artists. So that's, you know, I, you know, you make these, you know, you make these informed guesses, basically. Um, because you're nuts and you care about things like, uh, <laughs> like what would they put the paint in, which I do too. It's a good kind of nuts. <laughs> Um, okay, well, I think we, uh, we may run a little bit long, but we'll see if we can get, we'll see if we can get that all in. But I would love for each of you, um, starting with Flora, um, to tell me uh, if there's anyone else, anyone other than who's on the panel that you're, is doing work that you're excited about right now. Uh, for other projects, my former roommate, Amy Alba, she just came out with a video game called Tesca in the Shadows which takes place during the Mexican Revolution. I was her informal cultural consultant for it. It's a horror video game and it came out beautifully. You can play it online right now. And my cultural consultant for Malinchista, uh, you can find him on uh, Instagram is uh, Mi Corazon Mexica and he goes by Chicome and he's an amazing artist. Uh, it's really cool because on his Insta stories, he posts a lot of facts about Aztec history that are not well known. So it's, his stuff is amazing. And for future projects, I'm planning to work with my 
producer on Malinchista. She's going to be the director on a film about Black Lives Matter and criminalization of Black people in America. And we haven't started yet because we're still finishing up some post-production for Malinchista. Um, but I'm going to be her, her art director for that. So it's going to be really fun to work with her. She's great. And that's wow. uh, Letty Castellano. Wonderful. That sounds amazing. And thank you also for the recommendations for other people. Um, David, how about you? Definitely uh, Gonzalo Alvarez's Pio Man. It was originally Pollo Man, but he's now changed it to Pio Man. That's a graphic novel that's going to be coming out um, in the next couple of years. It's really incredible. I've seen all the, the storyboarding he's been doing and, and uh, have been helping him with novels and things like that. Um, my, I've always got tons of projects going on, but the principal one that I'm excited about right now is I'm co-authoring a book with uh, Guadalupe Garcia McCall called The Moon Conch, which tells two parallel stories about a Mexican girl um, leaving Veracruz and trying to get into the United States to, to reunite with her father, and a Mexica teenager trapped in Tenochtitlan during the, the four-month siege. Um, and it's just a, it's an incredible uh, project, and Paul's really helped me out with some great maps, so excited about that. And uh, Javier, I know you are uh, deep into working on Dream of Darkness. Do you have a timeline for that? And uh, also tell us if there's anything else, what else you're excited about that other people are doing? Yeah, of course. So right now you can already play. And even better, what we want to have is a positive impact. I believe history and art should help each other because each of these fields by itself has a lot of challenges already. So for example, in our case, since COVID-19 is really affecting teachers, but also physicians, so many people, we are uh, donating all the sales of our prototype to fighting COVID-19. Uh, you can go to our website. You have already uh, a lot of information. We have sometimes when it's available, uh, we can talk to Mario, to historians. And even more especially, if you use the code Aztec Comic Con, we'll give you even 10% uh, off at dreamofdarkness.com slash play so that we can defeat COVID-19 and everyone can get back to work as we all want to. That's wonderful that you're donating to that, uh, to that cause. Thank you. Sure thing. Um, it's always a pleasure to, to follow Mario. That's Visiones, his, his Twitter handle, because he shares a lot of very interesting details of history, how it relates to pop culture, that very few people can know because we don't have access to the kind of references that he has. I've enjoyed even looking at the real evidence of how sacrifices could have been. And since that's only in Spanish, it's very hard to, to access. So I, I also recommend his Twitter handle. You can get a lot of very interesting information. Yes, if you are watching this and you're a history nerd like all of us are, um, definitely follow Mario on uh, Twitter. Thank you. Yeah. And Paul, I know that I know for a fact that you're excited about the work of all the other panelists uh, who are on this panel. Is there anything else that uh, you've seen lately that you're excited about that you want to share with our audience? You know, I've been I've been so focused on on my research and what little time I have. Uh, you know, it's uh, I follow I follow these people. Um, <laughs> Um, gosh. Oh, what about the webcomic, the guy in Mexico City who's doing the webcomic? Oh, right. A shoe, uh, uh, Codex Black. I for, thank you for reminding me. Uh, by uh, uh, Shigu. Uh, we, we met him in uh, Mexico City. He, he, he does this thing called Cod Codex Black. It's a webcomic and it's uh, uh, pre-Hispanic. Uh, I think it even takes place when Manas Moctezuma was um, a mere warrior or a general before he even ascends. And then uh, it's done in a manga style, which wow. is interesting. And uh, so I would, I would check that out. Yeah, it's called Codex Black. Okay. Well, I want to thank all of you so much for participating in the panel um, and for sharing your works and your knowledge with us. Um, it's all wonderful and it's so interesting to see this history and this culture um, being incorporated into stories in different ways and in new ways that help us, uh, that help us understand it a little bit better than, than we did even 20 years ago, I think. Um, so thank you all. Uh, thank you to our audience and thank you Comic-Con. <laughs> Thanks. Take care everyone. Ask the crew. Woo!